Late at night when all the world sleeping, I stay up and think of you. And I wish on a star that somewhere you are thinking of me too. Hey guys, how's it going? It is I, the real Randy Chavez. I'm coming at you today with a part two video of I was an air traffic controller at Atlantic Municipal Airport Hour for 27 years. Here's my story. Uh, again, this is just a reading of someone on, on Reddit. Uh, I did a part one the other day. Everyone seemed to thoroughly enjoy it. They wanted more, more, more. So I'm here to give you more, more, more. This one seems to be a little bit longer. I have not read this one yet. I have not, I, I read the first one like six years ago when I was in the Air Force and I was alone in a terminal and I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. So I haven't read this update yet. Uh, I'm going to read it now with you. And here we go. Everyone say hello to Deshi. Hello, Deshi. So this won't make much sense if you haven't read my first write-up from a few months back. Again, this was a conversation with my uncle, who was an air traffic controller in Atlantic Municipal Airport in Iowa during the 70s. This is his account, word for word, and I am just typing it up. If you haven't seen the first video, go back and watch, and here we go. The city council finally listened to me and decided to install a security camera. Due to municipal bureaucracy and limited funds, or so they say, they only mounted one camera that could stream video to the control room. Stream, not record. Let that sink in. Who installs cameras that only stream? Now, Town of Atlantic does, that's who. Anyways, I had to pick my battles, so I had them install the camera in front of the tower door. That way I could always see who was outside. A good month had passed since the last encounter, and to be honest, the horror started to dull away. It was still fresh in my mind, yes, but the lack of new developments had me thinking it all ended as quickly as it started. And in my mind, she was probably just some lunatic who had moved on, whether it was drugs, whether it was mental issues, whatever. Then, on May 3rd, I received a memo letting me know I needed to stay late that day, since some local politician's plane was due to land around 10 p.m. Naturally, I guess my mind went straight into thinking about the crazy girl. You know, this is the first late night for me since the encounter. And around 9.45, and there was no sight of the plane. I, I didn't care, though. You know, my eyes were pretty glued to the binoculars, searching for any movement on the strip, even a minimal commotion. And then my heart would race. It still scares me thinking about it to this day. For some reason, I decided to look down at the monitor that the camera was streaming on, and my world turned upside down. I expected her. I really did. You could expect something unnatural, but you're never really ready for it. You always hope that it was just your imagination or something, but there she stood, right in front of the camera, in her summer white dress. She looked different, though, holding her arms as if she were freezing, shaking, and I could hear her crying through the crappy speakers that they gave me. This wasn't the entity I remember terrorizing me. This was different. So she looked up at the camera, and though the picture was grainy and black and white, remember it's the 70s, I, I could see tears in her eyes. She, she said, please, it's freezing out here. Uh, she was basically crying into the camera. Now the audio was obviously out of sync as she opened her mouth, and voice would come through the speakers, you know, a couple seconds later. She said, please, you know, I, I'm not sure what you'd do in that situation, but I immediately saw an opportunity. If I can bring her in and call the security guard, I'd finally have proof that I wasn't making it up. I said, Jerry, get to the control tower right now, please. I said that as I stood up over the radio. I walked down, and I, I, I know I shouldn't have left an active control tower, but this was my chance. Now, I propped up the door, adrenaline heckin' bursting through my pores, and I said, are, are you okay? You know, I kind of mumbled it to her, my voice cracking like a schoolgirl. <laughs> But I, I was scared, so, you know, take that for what it is. And she was still sobbing, hair covering her face. I was shaking. Not sure whether from the cold or fear or, or both, but I needed to get her to come in. So I, I stepped out. You know, she, she took a step, step towards me, still crying. I was like, ma'am, are you all right? So I spoke again, this time a little more firmly, like a man. And she moved the hair off her face, looked at me straight in the eyes, and got, damn, I can't explain it, but her eyes, although filled with tears, were not the same ones I saw on camera. They widened, and I swear to you, she was not blinking. So 
but I said, ma'am, please step back. As a chill went down my spine, and I said to her as she moved another step closer, she was just a couple feet away from me now. I said, ma'am, please step back. And then she repeated my words right back at me, nearly freezing my bloodline. My legs gave in like jelly. I almost fell to the ground. Her voice, her voice was not the same one that I spoke to on the camera. Her voice was, it was genderless. It, it, I don't know if that's a word, but her voice didn't belong to a woman, nor was it a man. I, I swear that, but that's not what, what petrified me. Goosebumps. I'm telling you the truth. Her freaking voice came out with delay, just like the one on camera. Her lips moved, but the words came out a few seconds later. What the fudge? I mumbled as I leaned against the door, not believing what I was seeing. Praying where, where, where the heck was Jerry? So, and the same thing, what the fudge? She mumbled back at me. That goddamn voice coming out after her mouth had closed. Leave me alone. Get the heck away from me. I screamed at her. And I, and I mean, I screamed it. I never heard myself this loud before accumulation of all the fear, adrenaline, anger, and she took a violent step towards me. Face got so close to mine, I swear her nose touched mine. She opened her mouth wide as if she were screaming, but it was silent. And heck, and then, seconds after she had closed her mouth, the scream came out of her throat. It was this unearthly, so piercing, I was shell-shocked. I was unable to move. I was frozen, still in the spot, and she, without moving her face from mine, raised her right arm, pointed at the cornfield. Her eyes were so wide that they, they didn't even look human anymore. She just stood like that for 30 seconds, an eternity in my time, not blinking. I couldn't take it anymore. I, I, I couldn't. I gathered all the bravery I ever had. I mustered up every ounce of power in my body, and I pushed her. Unlike invincible creatures in today's books and movies, she fell as any normal human would. She fell on her back, but as soon as she hit the ground, she got up unnaturally Olympic in shape fast. I mean, no human I've ever seen got up with such speed. And at that moment, I was certain that this was the end. But as soon as she stood back up, she turned around and ran towards the field. And I wasn't going to stop her. Not sure I even could. I stood there for some time, trying to figure out what reality I was living in, and finally gathered myself enough to climb back to the control room. Security guard Jerry showed up about 35 minutes later, giving me some BS excuse for taking so long. Anyway, the politician's plane landed late as well, and I, I just chose not to tell anyone about the encounter. I was running the risk of sounding like a loon at that point. So, I didn't know what to do, but I did know that she wasn't going to leave me alone. So I spent the next six nights at the airport glued to my binoculars, scanning the ground for any movement at all. I talked to the guard into doing a walkthrough of the strip every couple hours, just on the off chance that she'd be caught. Naturally, I didn't tell him what to look for, because, again, I didn't want to sound like a crazy person. But it was night seven since the encounter. Spending my hours staring down at my binoculars. Saw the guard walk around about 8.45. He sat me in the tower, laughed, waved, uh, giving me a thumbs up. I knew this wasn't going to work. She wasn't about to get caught. So when I showed up for the next day shift, everyone was giggling in the break room. I was like... Hey, what's going on? And just wanted to join the fun. And she said, oh, you know, Jerry the guard uh, said, bursting in laughter with others. I said, I, I don't understand. Uh, you know, what What about Jerry the guard? I said, well, I was just telling the guys about your boring nights. He said, <laughs> boring. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, come on, man. It's only guys in here. It's all right. And I was like, I, I, I don't understand. So, like, I, I don't get it. I said, well, I did see you guys last night, so I was just telling the boys about how good you have it up in that control room. I was like, what, what do you mean, what guys? Like, who, who'd you see? I says, ah, come on, I saw you and your lady friend up there last night when I did the walkthrough. Remember me waving at you? Like a reversing heckin' VHS, memories from last night started pouring through my mind. Nothing happened 
nothing at all that I could remember. I was looking at the airfield the whole night. Jerry even saw me and waved to me, and nothing was out of the ordinary. And then his wave, his laugh, the thumbs up. Yeah, I saw your lady friend standing behind you when I waved. Sorry, I didn't know it was a secret. I don't know how my legs worked, but I used them to run out of the break room at that moment, escorted by laughter from my co-workers. First thought was, okay, well, at least I wasn't going insane. Someone else saw her. But the second thought was, what in God's name? She, she, she was behind me? I, uh, for how long? I didn't even hear her. Didn't hear the footsteps. I didn't... Honestly, I had no idea what to do at that point. Uh, up until, you know, last time when she came up there, I heard her on the footsteps. It's almost impossible to go up those steps without hearing the, her footsteps. But the only hope for my well-being was that she'd get caught by someone other than me. Otherwise, everything I said to anyone would just make no sense, make me sound insane. They put me in the loony bin. So two weeks had passed, no other sighting of her. And sometime in early June, and mind you, I was still scanning the airstrip every night, I saw her at the edge of the field. She just stood there. I must have watched her for two hours. She didn't move a finger. She just stood looking straight at me, 100 yards away in the control tower. After the initial shock, and again, every time I saw her was a shock to me. I did the only logical thing, and I picked up the radio. I called Jerry, and I asked him to do a walkthrough. As soon as the door of the airport barn opened, she slowly walked back into the cornfield, never taking her eyes off me while she was doing it. And by the time Jerry walked where she stood, she was long gone. This happened every night for the next eight days. She'd stand at the edge of the field, staring at me and not blinking. Every time Jerry would come out, she'd slowly disappear into the field. One night I called Jerry up in the control room for a sip of whiskey, hoping she'd come out and I'd show her to him, but it's always so convenient in moving, so, you know. Entity whose existence you're trying to prove never appears before witnesses, right? Well, Jerry came up, shared a bottle of Jack Daniels over some small talk. I was discreetly keeping an eye on that cornfield. And at the same time, she always appeared, I noticed movement in the field. And there she was. She came out of the field and froze in the exact same spot she always did. I had to be careful because I was excited and I was overrun with emotion that she was finally about to get caught. I had to contain myself so I could look somewhat sane when telling Jerry what was happening. I said, hey Jerry, do uh, see what I see? I asked as I handed the binoculars. Said, down by the cornfield. And him staring straight down the strip were those longest five seconds of my life. What in the world that girl doing there? Man, the sense of relief that I felt. I said, alright, I, I got something to tell you. I spoke as calmly as I could. It took about five minutes to give him a gist of what was happening. Uh, all the stalking, control room destruction, incident on camera. Said, Jesus, man, why didn't you tell me something earlier? He asked. He was looking worried hurt. I was like, w would you have believed me? I, I asked with hope, and he just shook his head, nah. I said, alright, Jerry said as he stood up. You call police, I want to go down there and speak with her. I'll hold her till they come. I wanted to tell him to be careful, I wanted to even stop him, but more than anything really, I, I just wanted it all to end. So I dialed 911 while I watched Jerry walk down the strip towards this, uh, this thing by the field, and she wasn't moving. As a matter of fact, she was still looking straight at me. It was late. The Atlantic is such a small, uneventful town. Cops had to take a good 15 minutes to come to the airport. And my binoculars pointed at her as Jerry approached. I saw that he started to talk to her. Memory serves of the pilot she spoke to last time and how they just took off and told me to run. But She was still looking straight at my eyes while talking. All the way from there. Then, without taking her eyes off me, she leaned towards his ear and whispered something. Again, I'm not a lip reader. I don't know what it was, but Jerry took a step back. And then another one. He turned around and looked at me. 
I've never seen such a terrified look on another man. This man was beyond himself. Face so petrified he didn't even, he didn't even resemble the Jerry I knew anymore. And he ran into the field. I said, Jesus, it's the only thing I could say. And, and she was still looking at me. Only she had this, uh, this, this misbehaving smile on her face. Had it. That pilot, Jerry, both ran away from her after she whispered something to him. And why was I still there? What was happening to me? I freaking had it. So I ran down the stairs, out of the tower. She was standing in her spot. As I ran to her, I could see she had this freaking smile on her pale freaking face. No more talking. This wasn't a movie. I wasn't about to let her run again. I tackled her. Yeah, I know, I know, it sounds weird, but I ran into her so freaking hard. We both hit the pavement, and as soon as I got on top of her, she still had that smile. Even though there was a big cut on her forehead, she wasn't talking, she wasn't resisting, she was just laying there, smiling and bleeding. Heard the car pull up by the strip, and as you can imagine how thankful I was when I saw it was the police. It's like, over here, over here, I was screaming as I held her down, though she wasn't really trying to escape, and as the cops ran toward us, I looked at her one last time. It's like, why? Why? I asked, so frustrated, so, so angry, and she smiled even wider. See you later, alligator, she whispered. Seconds before a police officer pulled me off her, her words came out with that delay again. And that wasn't the last shock of the night. She said, help me, officer. This man was trying to kill me. The girl cried as the officer helped her up. He tried to murder me. I was speechless. I was like, this woman? I thought she was, what, a demon? Now she's trying to act human? I was sure she finally she was finally caught. But the cop turned on me. And I realized, like, oh, man. I was alone on the strip nearly choking a defenseless woman. Jerry, the security guard, nowhere to be found after he ran into the cornfields. Take me, I said as the officer stepped towards me. The sense of helplessness was one of the most overwhelming feelings I've ever experienced. But I told him, please, do not let her get away. So I spent the night in jail, certain that I was going to be found guilty for everything, with only witness long gone to who knows that who knows where well, my buddies from the airport came to bail me out in the morning I'd... I was just so tired I didn't sleep so I didn't feel like explaining anything I just I told him that if Jerry were here he'd tell you and he's like I said what Jerry's at the airport right now you know a buddy of mine said I, I was in disbelief I, I didn't want to waste a second so 20 minutes later I was standing in front of Jerry I was like Jerry wh wh why didn't you tell anyone I was near tears. And I was like, tell what? Jerry answered as, as he laughed, looking around the break room. It was now full of co-workers. I was like, Jerry, I went to jail because of you. Because of her. You, you, you can tell them. And he said, look, man, I, why don't you get some rest and we can talk about this later tonight. You know, Jerry said in kind of a condescending voice also, kind of patting my shoulder. And I, and I just lost it started crying. I was the most helpless man in the world. There was nobody that could help me. This hurt more than not understanding why Jerry chose to act as if nothing happened that night. So I walked out of that airport never came back. Three days later, I received a letter in the mail giving me a formal, you've been terminated notice. I'm kind of waiting for that. It was followed by a call from the police department saying that no charges would be filed as the woman is nowhere to be found. Go figure. So I moved to New York. Live with your aunt. And after that, I never did see that woman again. And to be honest, to this day, I'm not sure what I dealt with. If I had to put my hand on the Bible and say it wasn't a human who stalked me those nights in Iowa, I, I would. And at that point, my aunt walked into the room and, Is he talking about that woman in the Atlantic again? She said, trying to look irritated. And I was I was just telling the boy about what happened to me. You know, worth knowing what's out there. And she said, oh, stop it, Alice. Poor guys don't need to listen to your rambling. Rambling? Rambling? 
How about that? Since I left that damn airport, I said 41 air traffic controllers quit. How about that? I said, well, I think it's time to go. We overstayed as it is. My aunt said, trying to, trying to get out of the awkward situation. I'll walk you out, I said. And, uh, when we go outside the house, my uncle sat in the car. But I had to ask my aunt. I was like, was that, was that all? And I started, but she interrupted. And she said, oh, goodness, no. We, we don't like to talk about it, but your uncle started his depression medication around back that time. And it affected him in a strange way. Uh, back when medications weren't really that well researched and that's why he was let go unable to work at the airports again and the woman I asked she said oh yeah there was a girl there luckily the cops got him off her before she before he did any damage but he's been under control ever since no incidents you know knock on wood as she opened the door to the car I, I, I whispered one last thing like and the controllers who quit is that true? And my aunt's smile went from genuine to one that was obviously forced. We better get on the road, you know, before night falls. Call us sometime. You got our number, you know? See you later, alligator. And that was it. That was part two of the story. That was really heckin' good. I really enjoyed that a lot. Uh, so I'm happy that you guys like this. Happy that I like this. This is fun. Um, everyone, please comment, like, and subscribe. Comments are good for the YouTube algorithm. Everyone say bye-bye to Dashi. Bye-bye, Dashi. We love you. Goodbye. Meow, 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 meow.